Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to call the General Purposes Committee meeting to order, uh, ladies. Uh, first of all, on the agenda, we want to add a number six, which is the um, this uh, request from the Church on Five. Can I have a motion on the agenda accordingly? Second. All those in favor, post carried. Uh, then on the, on the minutes. Second. Second. All those in favor, post carried. Uh, then we have a presentation from YVR. We'll call forward Tamara Vruman, the president and CEO of the YVR, and Dan Namira, our representative on the board of directors. Please come forward. Well, good afternoon, Mayor Hello. Brody and members of council. Thank you very much for having us today. I'm sure all of you um, know Tamara Vrooman, President and CEO of Vancouver Airport Authority. However, I also like to introduce, introduce two of our senior uh, managers that are here with us today. We have Mike McNanny. McNanny. McNanny, sorry, Mike. Vice President and Chief External Affairs Officer and Trevor Boudreau, Director of Government, Government Relations. It has been my sincere pleasure to serve Richmond's nominee to YVR's Board of Directors since uh, 2020. During that time, I have seen the tremendous positive impact YVR has in the community. Richmond is YVR's hometown with businesses and residences greatly benefiting from YVR's sustainable operations and global connectivity. In 2023, under Tamara's leadership, YVR has created new economic opportunities by investing significantly on innovation, as well as making trade enabling investments that will increase access to global markets. I'm very grateful to serve on YVR's Board of Directors during this exciting time for Richmond's community. So with that, Mayor Brody, I'm pleased to turn the presentation over to Tamara. Thanks very much, uh, Dan, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. It's always a, a privilege to present to you and talk a little bit about uh, what's going on at the airport. I'd like to also thank uh, Dan for serving as the City of Richmond's uh, nominee. He calls himself the fish guy, but those of you who know Dan know he's so much more than that, and he brings a wealth of uh, leadership expertise and community connectedness to his work, and really want to thank you. Dan for serving on our board of directors. Also want to thank Serena and the team for the excellent partnership that we have with the city staff. You know, being uh, so close and being a part of the city of Richmond means there's multiple times when uh, we work together in partnership and really want to acknowledge uh, the leadership that Serena brings to the file each and every day. I'm going to take you through some highlights from 2023. My staff have, as always, prepared speaking notes. I'll mostly stick to the script, but hopefully we have enough time for questions uh, at the end. The uh, next slide would be great. Thanks. So 2023 was an exceptional year uh, for our airport. We welcomed 24.9 million passengers, the third highest passenger numbers in our entire history. And that's a significant uh, bounce back after the pandemic. We connected our community with more destinations in Canada and around the world, new routes including Dubai, Washington DC, Atlanta and Nashville, just to name a few. And this month, we launched Air Canada's new direct service to Singapore, a great opportunity to promote BC trade and exports. That's continuous service four times uh, weekly uh, throughout the year. Speaking of air cargo, YVR's capacity continues to grow while the capacity at other West Coast air, air airports contract. So we're seeing incremental growth at YVR on the goods movement uh, at the expense of other uh, airports, which really shows the importance of our regional gateway. Last year, we moved more than 319,000 tons of cargo and broke ground on our $150 million South Cargo Terminal expansion. This project will enable YVR to play an outsized role in supporting the growth of key sectors in BC's economy, including high value goods such as seafood from Stevenson, as well as advanced manufacturing components for new and emerging sectors. 
Um, and the heart of our success, of course, is our YVR team. 2023 was a year of unprecedented people growth for the airport. Uh, we increased our workforce to 908 employees to improve resiliency and better serve our passengers, effectively doubling our workforce in key operational and support uh, functions. We continue to be a certified living wage employer at the airport, and importantly, our commitment extends to companies that provide direct contracted services through our operations and maintenance. We also, next slide. We're also uh, pleased to be an important uh, part of the Richmond uh, community. Uh, Richmond's one of the largest benefactors to YVR's uh, success. As one of the city of Richmond's highest corporate taxpayers, in 2023, YVR contributed around $16.7 million. About 20% of the 26,000 employees that work on Sea Island live in the city of Richmond. And YVR works with 130 Richmond-based businesses directly. In 2023, this amounted to about $26 million worth of business. For example, Trident Millwork and Display Industries builds our check-in counters, as well as other custom millwork across the airport. We're also, next slide. We're also uh, advancing uh, clean aviation and goods movement. I'm proud to say that YVR is well on its way to becoming the world's greenest airport, achieving net zero in 2030 for our direct operations. Our climate action work started with direct operations, but as we move forward, YVR is taking a leadership role in creating a more sustainable aviation sector across the province. To that end, we're working with our partners in government and airports to plan for the future. On March 21st, Premier David Eby joined me at YVR to announce a three-year partnership agreement. Over the coming years, the province and YVR will work together to accelerate sustainable aviation fuel development locally. We will co-develop an action plan for all BC airports to become net zero by 2030, and we will advance work to transform YVR into a multimodal hub for the movement, and people, uh, movement of people and goods across our region. We're excited to understand where these multimodal pathways may exist and where we can use our significant competitive advantage here in Richmond to be a fully accessible multimodal hub. Next slide. Uh, last year I spoke to you about our innovation hub and YVR's digital twin. Through the digital twin, we're using information in new ways, enabling data-driven decision-making and collaboration that benefits our operations, our community connections, and passenger experience at YVR. We continue to expand the capabilities of the digital twin, and this past year, we incorporated YVR's entire airfield into the twin, unlocking new functionality and use cases. Moving forward, we're exploring opportunities to integrate the digital twin with work we're advancing with Richmond staff and the Ministry of Transportation to understand traffic flows and future road infrastructure investments to and from YVR. That work is important to addressing some of the congestion issues we're currently facing collectively throughout the coming years. And finally, Uh, 2023 focused on delivering a more predictable service to passengers in our community. We ended the year with a 91% customer satisfaction rate, uh, a 2.1% increase over 2022. But we're not stopping there. We'll advance critical work to provide a more accessible and inclusive travel experience for all people of all abilities throughout our airport. In 2023, we launched Beyond Accessibility, a new three-year accessibility plan and rolled out our new curbside greeters program. And we'll be making an announcement in the coming weeks on new programs to test local technologies to support people with reduced mobilities. We're also continuing on our journey to reimagine the culinary experience at YVR with more local offerings that feature the best of our region. Last year, in partnership with Pacific Autism Family Network, we proudly opened the Paper Plains Cafe, a first-of-its-kind inclusive and accessible restaurant at a Canadian airport. We're privileged, next slide. We're privileged, of course, to walk uh, beside Musqueam as the airport is located on the traditional territory of the Musqueam people. 
The last several years were difficult as we managed through the pandemic, but the experience of working with Musqueam strengthened our special relationship. I'm happy to say that today, 60 Musqueam members are employed at the airport and across the island. And we have a significant number of Musqueam businesses and joint ventures working at YVR. In 2023, we opened a new gathering place in the domestic arrivals area so people arriving at YVR can experience Musqueam culture. I hope you're able to visit the area when you're traveling through the airport. If not, I encourage you to take a moment next time you're at YVR. So that's a short snapshot of the year that was and some of our key priorities over the coming years. Before I take your questions, uh, I wanted to extend a sincere thank you to Mayor and Council. YVR is fortunate to call Richmond our home and to contribute directly to the prosperity of local residents. We're pleased and proud to be part of the Richmond community and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hobbs. Thank you, and through the chair, well, thanks for the presentation. It's certainly a big part of Richmond life and Metro Vancouver. Um, during the pandemic, you know, passenger traffic obviously fell way off, and you commented on that. Cargo traffic, I believe, actually ticked up even during the pandemic. So my question is, is there a balance to be achieved between passenger traffic and cargo traffic? Will your emphasis still be on both? because there's transportation issues, which you already touched on regarding cargo and passengers as well. So I'm just wondering, where is the balance to be achieved? Where is the emphasis going forward? Or is it gonna be both? Right, so uh, certainly it is uh, a blend of both and, and needs to be going forward. Most of our international long haul passenger routes, like the flight to a flight to Istanbul or to Dubai or to Singapore, also carries significant amount of belly cargo. And that actually makes those flights both viable and efficient. So there's, well, we as passengers always see the passenger experience. There's almost always uh, cargo involved somewhere through the value chain. What we saw, and that I don't see that changing, what we did see uh, during the pandemic was more what we call direct freighter cargo, and so uh, aircraft taking only cargo. And we have certainly seen an uptick in cargo, and that's why we're making investments in our cargo operations to ensure that we're more efficient with respect to the dispatch of trucks, to make sure that we use less fuel and have less idling so that trucks are dispatched in an effective way, and that we're thinking uh, quite a bit about how we can use other modes of transportation and connectivity to put less truck traffic on the roads as we're thinking about growing our cargo hub. So it's a part of the service that we provide. It's a part of what makes passenger travel actually uh, efficient and viable. And we do see an increased need. We need to be able to do it in a way though that is thoughtful about how much uh, of that cargo is moved by truck off Sea Island and what we can do to ensure that's efficient and safe. Hmm. Yeah, that, that'll be interesting to see what other mm -hmm. modes of transportation you do employ to move large amounts of cargo. So mm -hmm. thank you. One of the, um, Councillor Hobbs, one of the things we're looking at with the province of British Columbia is whether or not there's a multimodal opportunity to have the first air to marine cargo facility, mm. perhaps using some aspects of the river and uh, electronic river barges to move cargo directly from Sea Island, maybe to points east like the city of Mission. What's in the city of Mission? The railhead. And so we could go directly from uh, air to marine, to rail, thus skipping the uh, ground transportation network. So we're definitely thinking longer term and more broadly about how we can get cargo moving, which we need to do for our economy, but doing it in an efficient way that doesn't add to congestion through communities in particular. Yeah, moving things by the river, that's a good one because that's how everybody started, including right. the Musqueam, right? That's right. Thanks. Okay. Councillor Galanders. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. It's great to see all the things that are happening and the Paper Planes Cafe launch was really publicized last mm -hmm. year and people were really excited about that. Um, and the airport looks so beautiful as always. There's always seems to be more things to look at when you go through there and, and the efforts at reconciliation and Indigenous partnerships are really apparent and good for you for that. Um, I just was wondering, um, I get asked by the Sea Island residents sometimes if there's if we have any idea what development is going in um, 
northwest of the Dinsmore Bridge there on that big property. Do you have any little tidbits you could share or anything with us? Well, certainly that? since we put all of that dirt, the uh, preload on that piece of land, there's been lots of uh, lots of speculation that dirt was actually uh, made available by some other uh, work that we're doing elsewhere at the airport. So it's not a single a signal that we have plans imminent for that site. It's just the best place to have uh, put uh, that dirt as a result of other work we were doing. We do see opportunity for that mm. site in the future, though, and think that it's a perfect site for uh, connecting Sea Island to the rest of Richmond proper. Uh, but those are plans are a ways off, and of course, we'll be engaging with the public before we do that. Okay, just a follow up, uh, Your Worship. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but there's been some stuff in the media about that. Um, our shelter for our people experiencing homelessness are often being occupied by refugees that come from the airport or people seeking asylum. Mm. And we've been asking the, the federal government if they can pursue building another shelter that's closer to YVR, perhaps not even on YVR land. And I was just wondering if you've been approached by anybody yet or if this has been any thoughts that have come up within YVR or conversation? We haven't been approached uh, specifically uh, on, that, uh, on that item. No. Uh, Councillor Wolf. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just uh, the remaining question I have is in regards to the jet fuel pipeline and terminal. Could you speak to the operation level of that now? Yeah, the uh, the jet fuel pipeline, which is the uh, the pipeline that uh, connects the uh, airport to the uh, fuel uh, storage facility, is uh, fully operational and uh, after being uh, down for safety and remediation uh, inspections a little over a year ago, has been fully certified and is fully operational. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up then. Um, you spoke in your report on the sustainable aviation fuel, uh, and that's really about researching its capability and to locally develop it. Um, if we were to able to find some of it from some other source, could that be put into the pipeline and shipped to the airport? The, the beauty of sustainable aviation fuel is it is uh, can be blended with conventional aviation fuel, uh, either in a tank and uh, or at source and flow through the existing infrastructure that we have. So certainly we have the capability uh, through our fuel infrastructure to include sustainable aviation fuel should it be provided here. Great, thanks. And uh, yeah, next year's presentation, look forward to the celebration of uh, Ferguson Road uh, construction and completion because uh, with the ground uh, delivery right now of jet fuel and all the work, ongoing work there to include a multi-use pathway, much uh, uh, Richmond residents will be looking forward to getting uh, use of that space as well. So thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Councillor. We uh, we do hope it hope that that uh, multi-use pathway is open by the end of this summer. Councillor Day. Thank you very much. I'm over here. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. As always, YVR is uh, a leader in aviation and in airports around the world. Um, so my question was, um, with all the expansion of services, uh, do we still have the situation where there's far more jobs at YVR than there is people in Richmond who can fill those jobs? And do people still have to come from outside of Richmond? Mm. We certainly uh, uh, have experienced over the last uh, several months, and particularly in 2023, some significant job growth, uh, as you saw there. We are uh, very privileged and uh, are proud of the fact that we are regularly cited as one of the best employers uh, in the region and, and highly sought after uh, place to work. We are, we still do have turnover, of course, on an operation the size uh, of ours, there will be turnover, but we're not nearly in the position that we were at earlier in the pandemic with respect to the number of vacancies. We are uh, finding that people are coming to the airport, staying at the airport, and if they're moving on in positions, they're moving to other positions at our airport, which is exactly uh, what we want. And um, one of my favorite shows now on TV is Border Security, Canada's front line. Yes. And often YVR <laughs> is, uh, is featured, and yes. I'm astonished at the things that people will try right. to bring into the country. Any yes. comments on that? Well, our, uh, our border services uh, are uh, fantastic, uh, among the best in the world. We have a great partnership uh, with them. Uh, and yes, despite the, uh, the creativity of uh, people moving through our borders, they do an excellent job of keeping us safe, secure, and efficient. Uh, that efficiency is really important for moving people and goods to the airport, and they do a really good job. Thank you. Councillor Heed. Yes, my favorite program, CNN News. In case you wanted to know. Just uh, understand that you're a not-for-profit. I understand that. I understand that whole concept and how it is created. Do you still have your for-profit 
uh, identity with the expertise that YVR has. Can you just, I know, just briefly go over that and the success of that and whether it's something that's going to remain? Yeah, sure. We are, uh, thanks for that question. We are a rather unique uh, kind of organization, as, uh, as uh, you said, Councillor. We are uh, technically a, a private, non-share capital corporation under uh, Canadian law, which means that we must uh, earn a profit, but 100% of that profit must be reinvested in the airport for the betterment of the airport. And therefore, we are a private for-profit company that serves the public good. Technically, that gets shorthanded in legalese to a uh, non-profit corporation. But it's not a non-profit in the same way we'd think of the Cancer Society or a not-for-profit. We must earn a profit because, of course, we couldn't uh, pay for the investments that we need to make uh, without those profits. So we very much have a profit motive. Uh, but we do it always in a way, thinking about the future of the airport and the betterment of the airport and the ability of the airport to serve the region. Just a quick follow-up, Mayor. Uh, with you know, there was some discussion at one point. You were bidding for contracts in other airports. Is that still in the process? And does YVR have contracts at other airports? We do not have any contracts at other airports uh, at the moment. We are often called upon to share our expertise because we do have a number of areas where, frankly, we are among the leaders not only in Canada but uh, in the world. Uh, digitization would be. Uh, a most recent example, but I think you're referring to, we used to have something called YVR Airport Services that then became uh, Vantage, which was a company that was uh, spun off with uh, leaders from and experts from the airport uh, back in the late 90s and early 2000s. That company still exists. It recently won the bid uh, for the JFK Airport in New York, uh, and so YVR's expertise, if you like, is being exported uh, around the world, but we have no direct contact or relationship with them. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank <clears throat> you. And we'll look forward to your, to your uh, meeting, your AGM. Excellent. Thanks coming very much, Mayor. May. All right. Um, may I, let's, let's go to the community celebration grants allocation. Uh, uh, staff, anything to add to your report? We have nothing to add to the report, but happy to answer any questions. So, so it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on it? Councillor Day. Thank you very much. And what a lot of work to go through all these applications. My goodness. And uh, I, I know I told all my groups that I liaised to about these opportunities. Um, my question is on page 24. It says the amount requested was 88000 and we gave out 52000 in change. And quite a few of them, I, I was surprised that they didn't get more. And I know you have a ranking system. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Okay. Um, through the ranking um, criteria, we do actually look at five different things. So we look at alignment with the objectives of the program, inclusive, inclusive, accessible, and diversity. We look at capacity to host the event, as well as the budget to make sure that it's within their means and then sustainability. So we do look at those and then the five adjudicators do put a number to that and then that determines the percentage. So through the process, I mean, we around this table understand what those pillars mean. Do you um, ever give the opportunity to potentially explain, for instance, a successful applicant who got a little more money was this one because they covered these key points. Do you ever, um, not coach, but uh, advise uh, different groups how they might increase their funding for future applications? Uh, through the chair, through Councillor Day, yes, we do. Um, we do reach out to some of those who maybe weren't successful or also those who may have had a, a lower score um, in the past and then help them with their applications for the future. Good. I think that would be great. Thank you. Councillor Glanders. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the report and thanks for showing us all the exciting grants that are going to be getting given out. Um, my question is about how this year we separated the... Um, community, the celebration grant from the neighborhood block, sorry, from the block party grant, right? Um, and in doing so, the, some of the criteria changed for this, for this celebration grant in that previously individuals could apply, right? So I knew, I know somebody who last year had applied with a neighbor and they came up with an inclusive event that fit in with 
the celebration grant. And so this year they went to apply again and saw that they weren't able to apply as usual. Um, but what they do doesn't fall into the, I don't think it falls into the neighborhood small grants or the block um, party grants. Do, were you able to work with that applicant to explain which grants they were um, applicable for this year? Do you remember, do you know what I'm referring to? Uh, it was quite a few months ago that we talked about it. And I just Sorry, through the chair to Councillor uh, Galanders. I'm not familiar with maybe the one that you're speaking to directly, but we have spoken to a few okay. um, just to let them know of the differences between the two opportunities and then also working with them on those applications where needed. Um, but happy to, if you can send me the information, sure. to reach out to them. Thank you. Councillor Hobbs. Thanks, and through the chair, well, thanks for the report, and again, all the effort to sift through everything and make those judgment calls. Um, I like the eligibility uh, assessment. Uh, that was excellent, but I also liked on page, I think, GP18, it's the post-event deliverables, and it's uh, I like that built-in accountability as well. So could you just comment on what was the compliance rate in terms of accountability and evaluating what people had done, or the success rate, if you want to call it that? Um, through the chair to uh, Councillor Hobbs, so we had actually 100% um, uh, success rate on our deliverables as well as for those who um, were turning their summary reports and photos. So we got to see a lot of what the community was able to achieve with the dollars. Okay, so it's hard to improve on 100%, so uh, that was good. <laughs> okay, thank you. Councillor McNulty. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the report. Good job. It's always difficult when you're giving out grants. and. Um, when um, we give to, uh, I believe it's uh, 46 deserving um, uh, groups uh, that uh, uh, otherwise, uh, they fill, it fills a void where otherwise they might not be able to have these kinds of programs. I was thoroughly impressed and I read uh, your report line by line um, with regard to uh, each of their applications and uh, uh, they truly do, uh, um, and my, the important things in my uh, my, my vernacular is uh, with the inclusivity and the accessibility and the diversity uh, that each of them bring. And uh, your, your allocation of them, uh, removing the various barriers to help build community. That's what these grants are. You know, we get criticized often, the city's not doing enough, the city's not doing enough. I hear that all the time from certain groups in, in, the, in the community, and it's a very unfair um, uh, accusation. Uh, but when I look at the diversity of everything from a, a cadet league uh, to a block party type thing where it's bringing individuals together, I think it uh, augurs well for uh, the program. And that is not to say the other uh, million point two dollars that we have given uh, elsewhere. Uh, in many, as I said, in many cases, Your Worship, these, um, these fill a void where uh, other levels of government don't give money, and uh, it allows people to um, to uh, um, enrich their program um, where they're going from. Uh, I look at, uh, for example, uh, a turning point recovery, um, a barbecue. You may say, no, but please read the five lines that are there with that to understand what we're talking about, or a South Iron Community Association that has a block party read what, what it is doing. And uh, I think um, uh, that um, I hope that these organizations uh, will continue their success. But I'm also uh, um, a shout out to the 29 that didn't. Please read the criteria a little bit better and hopefully that next time they will be part of the group and uh, to be able to get some money. We can't give 100%, but I will look at the percentages. If you look at the percentages, um, most of them got 50% or greater. And that's a kiddo to, uh, you, you know, you ask for $1,000 and you walk away with, with 600. It's not bad. Uh, so uh, anyhow, thank you very much for the good work. I appreciate it. And uh, I do support the ones that you denied uh, given uh, what they didn't do, but uh, hopefully it's a lesson for them for next year. Thank you. Councillor Howe. Yes, Your Worship, I have an observation and a question. Now, uh, when I look at page 25, 26, uh, there are a number of schools, uh, the PAC groups, that they are being denied uh, for the application for the reason that they, uh, I mean, uh, in 
eligible application, not for a public event. Uh, but uh, when I look at the uh, other the approved uh, requests, such as number 18, number 28, uh, number 34, and number 37, so probably the only difference is, you know, they involve the community. Now, I understand that. My, my question is, when we have such a large number of schools and pack groups, um, you know, being rejected for that reason, did it show that uh, we are not clear enough in terms of the um, criteria, like the neighborhood element should be included? So, if, I mean, it seems to me strange that with such a large number of schools and impact groups being rejected for that simple reason. So, I mean, that's my observation and my question is, you know, should, it be able to, should we be able to do better in terms of helping them to understand the criteria? Um, yes, uh, through the chair to Councillor Ao, we, we observed that as well. There were some school packs that really seemed to understand the criteria and create new events that were open to the, the entire community. The ones that were restricted to students and parents, for example, like a private skate party, uh, the, we, we didn't feel were aligned with the, the objectives of the program. So we have already reached out to the assistant superintendent at the school board and had a conversation about it to say, what could we do better in the future to ensure that they fully understand the criteria? Um, so we did come up with a couple of ideas for next year to meet with the, the district pact and, and uh, circulate the information that way. And as always, and for any of you that are in touch with people in the community, usually the best place to start is to give us a call. Uh, because we're always happy to answer those questions. Yes, very good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, so the motion is on the floor. We'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? It's carried. Sister City Advisory Committee, uh, the year in review. Anything to add to your report? Uh, staff have nothing to add to the report and are happy to answer any questions. So that's moved and second to receive that for information. Councilor McNulty. Yeah, yeah, if I could, um, just a, a quick question. Uh, great report, thank you very much for what you've been doing and uh, the fact that we've been trying to hold things together in Sister City given the trying times in the world today. Um, has, has the committee, and maybe there's something uh, where the um, uh, school, school board um, Council Liaison Committee, um, and we haven't really had a, what I call a cultural exchange for many years um, to any of the countries, et cetera. And is that a thing of the past now? Uh, that's something that uh, uh, maybe is a by and by and the sister city committee would look to other types of things. The sports exchanges are very separate. They're specialized and, and that's great. I support them 100%. And, um, and I get the money. But the idea of uh, what the founding of the sister city back in 1973 was to have educational uh, exchanges among, among students. And uh, that I know it takes a great teacher to uh, spearhead it in the schools. I've been there myself. And um, Councilor Wolf will know what it's like to organize a group of youngsters to go overseas. But is that something um, that we have to either refocus? Relook at to see how we can continue doing it, or is it just one of interest or lack of interest? I guess is the word I want. Uh, through the chair to Councillor McNulty, uh, cultural and educational exchanges are still a priority for the Sister City Advisory Committee. Um, as per our mandate, it's a strong focus, and I can bring this back to the committee for further discussion as well as speak to our school board liaison. Maybe that can be brought up at school board liaison to to see if the the if the issues are still there. I, I mean, it takes a strong school board that allows those as well uh, to do it with individual schools as well. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. We'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Thanks, Alisa. Thank you. Uh, then we have the energy and emissions reporting requirements for large existing buildings. So, anything to add to your report? Your Worship, uh, <clears throat> through, or to the Chair, Your Worship, we have nothing further to add, uh, and happy to answer any questions. Those are recommendations. So that's moved and seconded. Uh, Councillor Wolf. Thank, thank you, Your Worship. I just have two questions. Uh, first one in the report on 87, it mentions that 
areas administered by Vancouver Port Authority and YVR Airport um, and other federally regulated large emitters are outside the scope, so they wouldn't fall into the timeline of those requirements going from 2024 to 2028 uh, unless they volunteer to be part of it. So my question is, um, the use of the word administer there, do those actually, does that mean it can be on non-port and non-airport land? And and no and not be part of this, um, or is the exemption only those administered on land that's owned by the port and the airport? Uh, uh, to, through the chair to Councillor Wolf, um, <clears throat> it's 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 open uh, for any anybody on the sorry for any organization or building owner and manager on those lands to voluntarily report and participate in the program but there's no requirement from uh, that's no requirement anticipated through the proposed program uh, to to have that so okay uh, thanks so oh, good luck finding or getting that volunteer participation uh, the second question I have is uh, in the attachments attachment one on page 91 it shows the summary from the 10 years ago, we did the uh, building energy challenge where uh, 124 buildings registered for the challenge. Um, and then since then, eight years ago, we haven't done that or haven't added extra challenges. Do we know if any of those have been continuing to collect their data and make improvements annually? Through the chair to Councillor Wolf, we don't have that information for current reporting. We expect that a lot have uh, remained to do so. Um, we, one thing that's uh, one of the many advantages of the proposed program is that we will have a chance to reestablish those connections through the proposed outreach and understand that. Um, one thing that uh, uh, is notable from, from Richmond's perspective is the leadership that uh, the city has provided on the benchmarking since that time and over a decade in all corners from advocacy to, to uh, um, new program development and supporting things like building Benchmark BC through to this stage where we're uh, going a little deeper again into this. So, Great. I'm looking forward to this and yeah, glad the largest buildings will be uh, in the benchmarking program. Thanks. Councillor Hobbs. Thanks and through the chair. Uh, thanks for the report. Uh, very interesting. Uh, information in parts of it and the 2014 voluntary program was an interesting one to look at but um, just for my edification maybe is um, when you talk about voluntary uh, engagement with the community that's good for large-scale industrial buildings uh, I think over a hundred thousand feet but can you just describe briefly how it is that you'd capture that energy consumption I gather you're talking about gas electricity for very large buildings and how is it that you actually capture that? Is it as straightforward as it might appear to me? Through the chair to Councillor Hobbs, uh, the platform that, uh, the common platform in North America that's utilized is something called Energy Star Portfolio Manager. Uh, and in that, um, um, a, a building owner or manager that's reporting on that will, like, will enter things like building name, area, postal code, uh, the climate zone, uh, location which is tied to a climate zone, age of a building, all those kind of building attributes. And then uh, specifically the metered information, uh, the location of your gas meters and, and, and electricity meters. And from that, uh, you set up the actual account. And once you have the, meter inf the metered data or location, you can download that information, three years of information from both Fortis BC and BC Hydro automatically. And so it, it's, it means right from the get-go, when you set that up, you have three years of data that you can mm -hmm. refer to to start comparing and tracking. So it's a really a, a straightforward process. And uh, once a building owner and manager is shown the way this works, it's actually relatively straight, straightforward. So. Okay. And then just to clarify, you kind of touched on it, but so you have the energy consumption, yes. right? And then if you look at buildings, even the same size that were built in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, there'd be different codes, there'd be different things that affect their uh, greenhouse gas emissions, right? Even if they consume the same amount of energy. And newer ones would probably consume less because of different efficiencies. So those kind of things are built into the formula, basically, that determines their greenhouse gas emissions? 
through the chair to Councillor Hobbs, yes, that's because a number of the attributes are, are normalized, normalized for weather, normalized for age, age of building and, and that. So that uh, gives you a, kind of a, the owner a better basis of comparison. But what, what uh, the building owner manager will see using the Energy Star Portfolio Manager <coughs> reporting tool is they'll see how their building or properties stack up against their similar counterparts. So if they know in which, if they're at the head of the pack, in the middle, or a little behind. And that's good information for uh, them to have to make those decisions on where improvements may need to be made strategically. Okay, thank you. Councillor Galanders. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to <clears throat> staff. Uh, yeah, thank you for the report as well. My, my question's sort of on the same lines as um, Councillor Hobbs's question. Um, on P GP87, you've got the estimates from the city, um, what you estimate the GHG emissions to be of all the buildings. And so then after the, the, the um, reporting begins, you're gonna be comparing the actual data with the estimates. Is that the, sort of the point of it? Just get a better picture of it? Through the charity, <coughs> Councillor Gillanders. Uh, yes, uh, that's definitely part of, part of the work is that comparative aspect. Um, that gives a building owner manager some of that value side of uh, actually voluntarily or um, uh, reporting on this using this platform. As part of the engagement process, uh, we're going to be talking about some of those benefits uh, that can result from participating in benchmarking and, uh, and, and entering their portfolio or building into the platform. That was the experience in the 2014-15 program where we had remarkable results from the ones that participated. Mm. So we expect that that would be the same here. And over North America, kind of North America wide uh, through Energy Star Portfolio Manager, they've looked at the improvements in terms of a, a survey of people that are buildings that have been reported on there in different classes, what the average improvement is. And it's anywhere from uh, seven to 12% over four years is kind of an average that could be expected in terms of efficiency gains, GHG emission reductions, and those improvements, so. Just a follow up question. Um, regarding the measuring the GHGs, this was the one that was on the lines of Councillor Hobbs. It, is it, I was just thinking about the administrative aspect of you got, you're running this business and then how are you going to start measuring this stuff? Is it just as simple as the utility bills and how much they're consuming and then put into your formula with the age of building? But um, what about things like how much waste they're producing, for example? Like, does that get factored in as well? Um, <clears throat> through the chair to Councillor Gillanders, uh, just, it just tracks energy use just energy at this stage. Use. And it's quite seamless from your utility bill information will, will derive because of the location of our electrical grid and, and, uh, and, the, and the gas utility, all that kind of um, GHG emission information is baked into that, the types of fuels that are being used. So right. getting those results back is really easy. Neat, thank you. Councillor Day. Thank you very much, Mayor Brody. Yeah, I paid also in 87, it says that staff will reach out to these partners during the engagement program to explore voluntary participation for those that are federally administered. So they're, they're technically off the hook if they don't want to. But I assume that through that process, she'll be reminding them, as Councillor Galander just pointed out, that once you have the data, you could potentially save a lot of money, and that's good for any business. Through the chair to Councillor Day, uh, that is exactly what we plan to do. <laughs> yes. Is uh, is we're going to have in these conversations and these dialogues and outreach that we're proposing, especially the larger buildings, we're going to capture those. Uh, you know, certainly the Port Authority and YVR. I expect that they're already participating in this uh, on their own. But for the um, yeah, so that's that's basically our approach. And and those that aren't, we're certainly try going to try to be convincing. Good, thank you. My question, <clears throat> so you're saying that we can't mandate a cap on energy use or <coughs> greenhouse gas emissions, right? Right? Uh, to the chair, yeah, the, the um, yes, that is correct. All right. For new construction, we have the zero carbon step code uh, and the energy step code to kind of manage the emission side. Uh, zero carbon step code sets out right yeah, but, requirements. But for but existing for existing building. buildings, we don't have that mechanism. Uh, okay, and it's it's within the it's within the it would be within the realm of the BC Building Code should the province choose to make it so. Okay, well, but but your ultimate goal, as I understand, is to <clears throat> get the information from the building 
owners and operators as to their efficiency, basically, in various ways. Now, how are you going to how are you going to mandate that? Uh, through the chair, um, it, it's one step at a time at this point. What we're doing is uh, proposing an engagement program and a process to, to engage the building owners and managers of large properties. But the, the rationale for the engagement is partly based on the city is, is contemplating an eventual requirement to, to confidentially share that information with the city uh, and, um, and through that conversation understand uh, um, you know, what could be the challenges they have in terms of participating in energy benchmarking, setting up an Energy Star portfolio manager account. But as I understand the, the report, mm -hmm. the authority of local governments to mandate building owners to share energy consumption and GHG emission data from their building. I mean, you're saying you've got the authority, um, but how are you going to, what are you going to do if they don't tell you? Or you can't get it from various... Uh, sources through the chair. Uh, the the mandate would come from a proposed bylaw, basically through a bylaw enactment. Uh, should council choose to adopt? Okay, so the bylaw says you have to tell us uh, and and just disclose uh, total energy use, total emissions uh, right. annually, and that's right. it. And if they don't, what? Through the chair. Um, at this stage, we're. We're not looking at anything beyond uh, that. Um, some other jurisdictions have contemplated uh, potential penalty. Um, we haven't uh, we haven't contemplated that or included that kind of assumption at this stage. Mr. Russell, uh, through, Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> I think we want to make this easy for builders, and uh, you know we'll cross those bridges if that comes to that, based on our or early years of doing the program. If we're having high levels of non-compliance, non we'll have to look at how we get to compliance. I don't think at this early stage we would, um, the bylaw might note penalties, but we wouldn't pursue that. We want to make this uh, easy for business and, and show them the, the benefits of doing so. Okay, but that's not your ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to get the data, yes. Um, if there are challenges, we'll, we'll address those when they come. All right. All right, thank you very much. Councillor Liu, uh, last th questions. Thank you, through you to staff. Uh, thank you for this. So this is just going out and talking to businesses for right now. Are we also talking to the Chamber of Commerce and getting a broader um, discussion going? The or chair, can we do that? To the chair, through, uh, <clears throat> to Councillor Liu. Yes, we will be uh, uh, keeping the Chamber informed of this to kind of... Uh, build awareness of uh, the city's uh, approach and engagement, proposed engagement, yes. Okay, now why wouldn't, this is talking about potentially putting in a bylaw in the fall, like why wouldn't we just have people do it voluntarily for a year or not or whatever? Um, like I've heard anecdotally from some businesses in Richmond that you know they've waited two years for a permit to put in some new machinery, they're you know waiting for all this other things to happen, business permits, this, that, and the other thing, they're already irate at us. They've seen their school taxes go up, property taxes go up, all these things go up and up, and now we're asking for more work from their staff when they're already running pretty lean ships to begin with. So um, while it sounds good, it's got benefits to the company itself, um, I don't love the idea that we're going to be more purveyors of bureaucracy than we already are. And so uh, I'm wondering why why the push towards potentially doing a bylaw instead of continuing with the voluntary? To the chair, to Councillor Lou, the, the rationale behind this is to basically engage the sector, a sector that hasn't been engaged very directly uh, by city staff, certainly on an energy and emissions side of things. So it's to get those conversations, that dialogue, those contacts and es established so we can have those conversations, talk about the benefits of benchmarking, and how it's how to set it up. Um, the experiences on companies that have set up um, energy and emissions benchmarking through and and are tracking it annually is really positive. The other thing is that uh, through this kind of process, we get a chance to have that conversation to understand what kind of incentives uh, they'd be looking for if they're looking to decarbonize some of their systems. So part of this is is obviously about us meeting our citywide climate tar targets in this sector that hasn't been engaged 
that deeply yet, but to also build those bridges and establish those contacts, understand the concerns. If there's significant pushback on the way, we'll walk back from that without a doubt. Okay. Um, so that's basically it. It's kind of like where the city was prior to the establishment of the BC Energy Step Code. We had to figure out how to engage with the sectors that were going to be affected by that. Okay. And there was a lot of concern at the time about those, those kind of things. So it's kind of like switching back 10 years, except for existing buildings and having these, having this engagement approach. Okay. Because like... Maybe you haven't heard it, but I know of a major business that sold out here in Richmond because they were so irate about part of the process that they dealt with, so that related to all this energy efficiency stuff. So um, it's there. It's real in the business community. Um, I think there's benefit in measuring this and having those conversations, but I think taking a heavy hand, I'm loath to do that. So I will support this portion of it. Yeah, there's more to come. We're going to hear more about this. All right, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Uh, thank you, gents. Uh, the award of the contract moved, and is it seconded? It's moved and seconded. Uh, Grant, anything to add to your report? Uh, no, Your Worship. Uh, I have nothing to add. I'm happy to take any questions. All right. I'm not seeing any questions. Councillor Day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for this. So we currently have PeopleSoft Software Technical, and then we're going to be um, awarding to Oracle Canada. And it says in the memo in the uh, motion that it's one point two six million dollars, but then it says on page ninety six that the financial impact is none because the funding is already in the five year um, financial plan. Could you just explain that? It's a little bit confusing. Uh, yeah, through your worship to uh, Councillor Day. Uh, we entered into an agreement with uh, PeopleSoft Canada in 1998. That was based on a uh, publicly held uh, RFP process at that time, uh, where the city through that process had selected uh, PeopleSoft as being its primary enterprise resource planning or ERP system for doing financials, uh, HR management, and payroll. Subsequently in 2004, PeopleSoft was acquired by Oracle Canada. Okay. And so Oracle had uh, acquired a number of different ERP systems, uh, PeopleSoft being one of them. And so now it's actually part of the Oracle family. Okay? When uh, you enter into these types of agreements, uh, essentially you're making a, a pretty substantial commitment uh, because the ongoing support, the ongoing patching, the ongoing security fixes uh, that would become available for these uh, environments are only available by the software vendor directly. Like, so there's no market, there's nowhere else to go to. You have to get them from the original vendor and so in this context is why we essentially are saying we recommend single sourcing to Oracle because they are the only provider uh, for these updates and patches. We have benefited in the past uh, where we've done upgrade projects and we've moved to new versions of PeopleSoft and have not had license costs because those upgrades have been covered under the uh, software agreements. That clears it up for me. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'm going to call the motion or question on the motion. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Um, now we have the addition to the agenda, which is the Church on Five matter. Um, no, no, no. Um, I, I understand that people want to speak to this. This is this is a late addition to the agenda. We've got a very complete letter. And Councillor McNulty has indicated that he wants to have a referral on this. So I'm going to go to him for the motion. Um, thank you, thank you, Worship. Uh, on this, this particular, I do, I do want to make a few comments, uh, first of all, and, and ask staff a question. Um, on, on this particular, we all got the letter, and I did circulate it to you on the request for Church on Five. And um, my concern on, on this whole thing is I... I'm in support of, of giving monies uh, for the food, but I guess uh, to whatever staff member, uh, how long would it take to analyze some programs and tell us what the, the outcome would be after December 24th this year? So in other words, make, make specific what, what comment on the long term. Everything on the letter from the, the short term. The short term, term, I, long can, term. I can support. But what about what happens after this? Where and what is the status of the other referrals on the food that we've had? 
Through your worship to Councillor McNulty, I'll start with the status on the other referral mm -hmm. that is in the process of being finalized and expected uh, to have a report back to Council in May. In May? In May. Yeah, okay. All right. Do you want to make your referral motion? Um, well, I, I'm, I'll, I'll make a referral mo Well, I, I want to, um, I want to actually uh, make two. I'm a, I, I'd like to have a debate on the 54, 560, and then uh, refer um, the other programs back um, to staff to analyze uh, for um, uh, where we are after December 24th. All right, I'm going to make a motion to refer the entire matter to staff for their analysis and report back as soon as possible. Second. So that's moved and seconded. And the reason, the reason that I'm suggesting a referral of the entire matter is because we do have a fairly complete letter from the church on five, and there's obviously a lot of factors that we need to consider in that letter, but we have to put it into a larger context. There are questions like, first of all, why isn't the province being asked to provide this, this type of support? Uh, after all, all the social service programs are basically provincial. Uh, secondly, what are we already doing with this group and with other groups? Uh, what are the funding sources? Uh, and uh, just all the factors that are, are involved in this. I realize that that uh, this group is asking for a, a fast turnaround on this, and I would encourage uh, staff to do that very thing, but we do need to know this in a larger context than just, just having a letter and approving uh, some kind of a grant based on that when we've gone through, we go through dozens and hundreds of grants, and it's gotta be put in a larger context. So we'll go to Councillor Day. Thank you very much, Mayor Brody. Um, there are people from Church on Five in the audience. Yes. Would be allowed to ask them some questions, given that the points that you bring up are valid. Let's let's find out. You know why? No, is it we need to know it from the the staff's point of view, from the city's point of view, first to buttress the very uh, detailed information that we already have in this letter. Uh, so, so, being a late so addition, like it is, uh, or or we can put it off to a further meeting if if that's what you want, but. Uh, um, can we get a timeline from staff, please? Can you give us, a, you know, could you have something within a week with, a, with at least a basic comments? Through your worship, uh, to your worship, uh, staff could try and put something together within a week and bring that back to council. Another question of staff, please. Um, I realize that we're in the process of hiring outreach workers. Will they be out in the evening feeding 80 to 100 people a night? Through your worship to Councillor Day, the homelessness outreach workers will be out in the evening. There is not a meal component to the city's outreach program. So there's no food going. Okay, and um, how, how is this program, I'm sure you've read the letter, different from what our city staff will be doing as outreach workers? If you know. Through your worship to Councillor Day, the, my understanding of the primary focus of this program is initially to deliver meals provided by the various faith-based organizations outlined in the letter. The city's outreach program is focused on connecting with individuals in the community who may be experiencing homelessness and supporting them to connect to resources, referrals, and ultimately, if they wish, housing. And no one can argue that those services are very much needed, for sure. But um, if we, as of May 1st, lose 80 to 100 meals a night, that's going to affect a lot of people. And I understand from the letter that um, 30 to 40 percent of the people that are now homeless are women. Uh, so I've got some serious concerns about that. Um, I, I realize that this has come, I mean, we've been talking about this for months, and this is basically a, a crisis situation where we are down to the wire. So do you think it's logical that given that there are so many faith groups involved in this, like I'm looking at the long, long, long list of, of all the churches and uh, organizations that are donating and giving food to this program, 
is there any question in your mind that this is a well-established program and that it has been successful? I think you're asking for a conclusion on this. I think we need to make the referral to find out exactly those kinds of issues. I would hope that that would come back for council vote well before May 1st. Councillor Heed. Yes, Mayor, I agree with you on the referral. However, uh, the timeline is of critical importance mm -hmm. here. And I think if we can at least have the decision related to the $54,560 by in a week's time, that would be helpful. And if it requires uh, a more contextualization of this and how we go forward, that could come at a, a later time. But I think if we could have uh, the decision regarding the 54,560 would be appreciative for council to look at in a week's time and the other absolutely uh, it would take a bit of time. Councillor Galanders. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, I was prepared to to pass something tonight if that was going to fly, but um, you know, we don't have a proper notice of motion and so if the referral is going to be uh, the only thing that will be allowed tonight. Um, I support that, but with also um, the timeline being one week, simply because today being the 15th, um, with the emergency um, weather shelters not being open anymore as of tonight, I think we need all boots on the ground. I think we've, we've got, um, we had no problem giving money to one organization to be an ombudsman um, during this time. I think we need more than that. I think we need everybody that's currently out in the community doing the work to be able to fund it, to keep doing it, to prevent encampments. I know that this program is not simply food aid. I think that food is the way to uh, connect with people and then this outreach also connects people with tons of services and, and helps keep them safe and keep the community safe and help find solutions for people. So we need all the organizations in Richmond that are doing this work to have the funding to keep doing it during this really important time. Councillor Liu. Uh, thank you. Through you to staff, thank you for your work on this. Everything you've done to date and everything you're going to continue doing. Um, it, it seems to me what we're being asked for is over the next eight months a support for a, a worker, but then there's also talk of a specific allocation to a specific person. And so I'm thinking that the benefit of this going to a referral is that we can have some legal advice on this because it seems to me that if we make a council resolution on the fly that gives one specifically named individual a a benefit like that, it might sh it might be offside for us as a council. So I think it makes sense to at least get some legal advice on that. And you know, if we wait a week or two, it's not a big deal. This is talking about a program that's over the next eight months. So if there's a two week delay, it's still going to likely happen. So I think we need to make sure we cross our T's and dot our I's and do this properly. Okay, Councillor Hobbs. Thanks, and through the chair, um, I appreciate the, uh, the initial, oh, I'll support this referral, and I do appreciate the work that's been done to date. Uh, the Church on Five does great work. The food delivery program uh, that we're talking about, I think, is uh, very important to a lot of people. I've seen it in action a little bit, but uh, I do think it's important for us to have a little bit of a step back and take a week or two weeks uh, to look at it in the context of the outstanding referral and to look at some of the issues that have been mentioned, like other funding sources, provincial grants, whatever might come into play. And I think that um, the time frame that's been outlined uh, well, by the chair, I think still allows us to make a timely decision on that. So um, I'll be supporting the referral. Thank you. Councilor McNulty. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, before I, I agreed to support the referral, that's why I didn't move it. I'm, having read this more, this is a plea for help and a cry for help. I don't know, uh, we don't have the service now. Uh, can we have this on the agenda next Monday? Staff you said I was told a week. Staff is has it? indicated they're, they're going to try to do that. Okay, and but they're not going to answer all we'll of go to the, the bureaucratic CAO. stuff that I've heard to around the table. To our CAO. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship, and through you to Council McNulty. Uh, we have a referral, an existing referral from January 
that staff review and report back on what is needed in form of in-kind services, people, and funding to support the 15 nonprofit organizations providing emergency meals to feed food insecure individuals in Richmond and the feasibility of providing this support. Uh, staff has drafted uh, the report to respond to that referral. What we can do is expedite it to bring that comp comprehensive response back next Monday and review this request in the context of that report and uh, provided the chair uh, supports that it can go on the agenda for direct to council next week. Okay, so we're having the, through you, you worship to staff, to have the CAO. Uh, it's taken this long to get the report from January. Are we gonna get that next week? Through, through the mayor to Councilor McNulty, yes, that's correct. Okay, but you, you've assured, you will assure me that we'll be able to have the full report next week? That's what she said. Yes. Well, I want to hear it again. Through the mayor to Councilor McNulty, yes, that report is drafted. In fact, it was getting ready to go on an agenda when we received this letter. So I asked staff to review that report in the context of this letter prior to moving it forward. So it is ready to go. Obviously, there's a rel reluctance on this one, but anyhow. I'll, uh, I'll support it for a week, but that's it. Councillor Day. Just to, to, to be clear, so we're, we've got a letter from January that we're now, we were going to get it in May, but we're now going to get it in April. Is, 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 are you then saying that this $54,000 and change that will keep this food program going for the rest of the year can be added to that as an add-on? Through the chair to Councillor Day, I'm not saying that at the moment. Uh, I think staff will be reviewing this letter in the context of the full picture and the response, and we will respond to that next week in the report. Will that come with recommendations? Will that, Sorry? Com will that come with recommendations? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Day, yes, that will come with recommendations. Yeah. All right, let's call the question then on the referral motion. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Okay, uh, someone move adjournment. Okay, and the next meeting we'll call the finance meeting to order. Um, just hang on a sec. <clears throat> Okay, so we've got the special finance meeting. We have a motion on the minutes. All those in favor, post carried. And then the property tax rates. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion, all those in favor? Oh, Councillor Wolf has a question. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Thanks for the update. Uh, Hold the mic in, please. Oh, thanks. Um, the memo that came or was this April 9th? Could you just clarify what is here that isn't in our package? Because a lot of it looks the same, but some of the numbers on Schedule A are slightly altered. Could you talk about the altered? Because there's just not a lot of detail in the headings here. Yes. Thanks. Through the Chair to Councillor Wolf. So the only change is in the bylaw itself. Um, and the reason you received this memo is that the rates from the regional district were received on April the 9th. So in order to calculate their rates, um, this bylaw change had to take place. Um, the original package had the 2023 rates that were highlighted in yellow mm -hmm. and um, receiving the regional district rates on April the 9th is why you received this memo with just the regional district rates. Changed. Okay. Thanks. And a follow up on that. Was there any surprises in the Metro Vancouver rates from the 2023 to the 2024? No, no. there were okay. no surprises. They just have um, per legislation till April the 10th to deliver them. Normally, we do receive them earlier than that. Okay, thanks. My other question was under your highlights in the report, mostly on page six to seven, um, there was highlights there, but the ones that I was interested in were not included there. So. Uh, on our page fin, not, fin six, sorry, uh, for the table one at the top, the two significant changes I noticed, but there was no comment on them, and maybe you could provide that now, 
Uh, class four major industry had the, the largest um, percentage market value change of any of them. So up 14%. Uh, and then the only one that went down was the class eight recreation nonprofit. And I don't know if you could comment if those are highlights or anything significant about those two. Sure. <clears throat> Through the chair to Councillor Wolf. Um, the the um, recreational nonprofit, a lot of times the reason there is a change is a change in class. So um, the market change for major industry, I would have to um, look to see what has happened there specifically. Um, but uh, the recreational is primarily a change in class. Thank you. A very final uh, follow-up then on that exact last point there. So we, Richmond, are the highest in the region for having a high percentage of total assessment when it comes to the recreational nonprofit um, folios. Could you comment on why that is, or is it is it made up of um, like something significant that I'm not seeing? Why do why does Richmond have the largest percentage in total assessment when it comes to recreation and nonprofit? which is 475, as far as, as, far as I saw. That's sorry, I'm, no. I, I'll have to okay. get back to you. Or thanks. I'm sorry. All right, we're gonna call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? That is carried. We're, we're now adjourned. And I'm gonna call the closed